Some years back, I was the guest preacher at a Presbyterian church. The service had ended, and I was out at the front door greeting people as they left the church. And at the end of the line, I could see this man. At the end of the line, there was this man waiting who clearly had something that he wanted to tell me. So he got to me, and we shook hands. We did that back then. And I said, hello. And he said to me, can I tell you a funny story? And I said, sure. Why not? And he said, well, let's step outside. And he motioned out the front door of the church. And so I crossed the threshold with him out onto the front portico, and the man proceeded to tell me a joke. He was very proud of his joke. And it's been a long time, and I don't remember the specifics, but I do recall that it really wasn't all that funny, and it was also eh, a little off color. It was a joke that you wouldn't want to tell in polite company. And I could see why he wanted to step outside. Now, I was a guest in that church, and I didn't know this man, so there, there wasn't much that I could do. I mean, the joke wasn't awful. I've certainly heard worse. But later on, as I reflected on that moment, I was increasingly troubled. I wish I could have handled the situation differently. Honestly, I'm still not sure what the best course of action would have been, but I do now know what I would have liked to have said to that man. So why did the man ask me to step outside the church? Well, clearly he felt that his joke was inappropriate in the sanctuary, and we can understand this. The sanctuary is a sacred space. And by sacred, we mean that it is holy, that God is present here. But why step outside? Did the man feel that God was in the church, but not out in the world? And that's a trap that we all fall into, believing that God is inside but not outside, that God is limited to one location and that if we just move to the right place, we can get away from God. Later, I did decide that what I would have liked to have said to this man is, you know, if you're not comfortable saying what you want to say in here, I'm not sure that it's something that I want to hear out here. In other words, if you won't say it in front of God, perhaps it just shouldn't be said. Today's sermon is the fifth in this summer sermon series on the life of King David. As we go through this series, I will keep asking the question, why did God choose this particular person to be king? He wasn't a member of a royal family. He wasn't next in line for the throne. In fact, in his own family, he was the youngest of eight boys. He was never destined to be king of anything. He was a shepherd boy. And yet, yet God chose him. God anointed him. What was it about this person, David, that was so special? Well, the answer, as we've seen, is that God chose David because David at heart, was a shepherd. As king, David would rule over his people, God's people, but do so with the care of a shepherd watching for his flock. As shepherd, David understood that he worked for someone else, the owner of the flock. The sheep didn't belong to him, but they were in his care. And David cared for and protected and led the sheep with a godly devotion. David understood the relationship between the sheep and the shepherd and God. When David went up against the Philistine champion Goliath, 
He wasn't afraid because he remembered how God had protected him as a shepherd guarding the sheep. David would rule his kingdom like a shepherd guards his flock. He was a shepherd king. Last week we read the account of David bringing the Ark of the Covenant up from the countryside to its new home in Jerusalem. The Ark was that box containing the tablets with the commandments, and it was viewed as God's throne here on earth. Wherever the Ark was, God was there. And as the Ark was driven towards Jerusalem, you remember David led the procession dancing before the Ark. And he brought the ark into the city and he placed it into a tabernacle that he had constructed. A tabernacle like the one that Moses had made for the ark so many generations earlier. As a king, David was hugely successful. He succeeded in every way that his predecessor Saul had failed. As King David established his home in Jerusalem after capturing that city from the Jebusites. He made it the capital of Israel. He also made Jerusalem home of the ark. He defeated, with God's help, Israel's enemies. He built a magnificent palace made of cedar wood, which came from Lebanon, of course. And all this success provided him now with the freedom to relax and to reflect on his life. And as he reflected, one thing began to trouble him. And that was the disparity of him residing in luxury in his palace, breathing the sweet aromatics of the cedar wood, while God remained outside in a tent. And David recognizes the imbalance of this situation. His living in a grand palace while God is in the canvas tabernacle. It just didn't seem proper. Other kings, other kings, they build magnificent temples for their gods. And it appears that David has done nothing for his god. So David formulates a plan, a plan to build a temple to house the Ark of the Covenant, and this would be a building worthy of his God. David, once having put this plan together, he calls in Nathan, the prophet, and David begins to explain to Nathan his plan. He says to Nathan, see now. I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. And before he gets any further, that's all he says, Nathan interrupts him. Nathan doesn't need to hear the entire plan. He's heard enough. He gets it and he says to the king, go, do all that you have in mind. Why? Yahweh is with you. Now, as a pastor, I can certainly understand this. I'm like Nathan. Let's say that one day I get a phone call from a church member who asked me to come to her office. I go, and that person talks about our church and its needs. She focuses on the church's lack of adequate space for our Sunday school classes. And she observes that there's a children's class meeting in an old closet. And she suggests that what we need to do is to build an education wing and she offers to pay for it. She also promises to handle all the construction details. It will be a turnkey operation. All she needs from me is to say yes. And you know what I would say? I would say exactly what Nathan said. Go. Do all that you have in mind. Sadly, it's usually at this point that I wake up from that dream 
But Nathan wasn't wrong. David had a good plan. They needed a temple. Go, do it. Yahweh is with you. Nathan gives David the prophet's stamp of approval. But we learn that Nathan was wrong. And that night, God spoke to him. God wasn't okay with David's plan. And God came to Nathan and instructs him that he needs to go back talk to the king and God wants Nathan to relay a message and the message is this David's not the one to build God a temple God reminds David that since the time that the Hebrews were out wandering in the wilderness that God never had a house of his own that God always lived in a tent and that God moved around with his people from place to place. Never has God asked for anything more than that. God informs David that it will not be David who builds God a house. But rather it will be God who is going to make a house for David. And when God says house, we read the word the Hebrew word bayit, which means house, but it also means kingdom or dynasty. So this play on this word just rolls around through this passage. David had fallen into the trap of association, associating God with a place, a locale, a structure even. And that's understandable since the Israelites associated the location of the ark with God's place on earth. But David needed to learn that God is not limited to a shrine or to a building. That God is everywhere. Our God moves about, moves with us. Our God makes every place sacred. God's promise to David was not just for a kingdom. What God was doing was making a covenant here. And the covenant is God's commitment to watch over David and his people forever. A commitment to be like a parent whose love is guaranteed through the ages. But there's more to this covenant than just God's promise. There's also an expectation on David's side of the covenant, God will give David a great name and a house for his descendants. That's what God will do. But in turn, God expects those who populate that house or kingdom to do so in God's name. As we find in our reading today, God says, I will raise up your offspring after you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a kingdom for my name. The kingdom is meant to reflect God. Remember that man at the church door who pulled me aside to get away from where God could hear him? He clearly misunderstood church. The church is not the place where we keep God. The church is to be a sign of the greater kingdom. At its best, the church points to the kingdom. It should be like a great flashing arrow in the middle of town telling people good stuff here. This building, like every church, does not contain God, but reminds us that God is with us as God promised. And the purpose of this sanctuary is not to hold God, but to instead focus our whole being on the presence of God and invite us to worship the one who commits to be with us in every time and place. We do consider ourselves the spiritual descendants of David. We are residents of that promised kingdom. And so the million dollar question before us is this. Are we living in such a way 
that others will know that God's name is on our kingdom. When they look at what we do and how we live and how we speak, is it obvious that we are working for God? Every person inhabits one kingdom or another, and that kingdom determines our priorities, the way we live. Our kingdom, well, it could be anything. It could be money or family or power or faith. Sadly, not every kingdom has God's name on it. And we see this this very week as we watch the news and watch in real time as the government of Afghanistan falls to the Taliban militants. As of Friday, the Taliban had captured over half of the regional capitals of Afghanistan and were converging on Kabul. Kabul will soon fall. The Taliban emerged in 1994 as a faction in the Afghan Civil War. They are influenced by a radical and strict interpretation of Islamic law, and they use atrocities and terror to enforce their will. They kill those who stand against them. They enslave women, take child brides, and prohibit girls from working or getting an education. Our prayers must be with the innocent people of that country. And it's clear when we look at the actions of the Taliban, the sort of kingdom that they are building, one of fear and power. Now, the Taliban is an extreme example, but it's not difficult to look around and see other people creating their own kingdom. And it's usually not difficult to see whose name is attached to those kingdoms. As people of faith, as descendants of David, we are the ones with whom God made that covenant. And so we should strive with all our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength to construct God's holy kingdom on this earth. A kingdom built on a foundation of love and compassion and forgiveness and mercy and grace. I would like now to close with God's words spoken through the prophet Isaiah. There we read, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? Amen.